In this video presentation, what we're going to discuss is the budget line. What in fact is the budget line and what factors can affect or impact this particular curve? As a consumer, remember, while we may have a limitless amount of wants and needs, we are limited by the resources that we have. And under the ordinary utility theory, while we have that an indifference map for every, for every consumer, which means that every consumer has an almost unlimited amount of indifference curves represented on the indifference map, what will actually determine what indifference curve that consumer will be upon is their budget line. Now, what is there for the budget line? The budget line will display the different combination choices that the consumer can actually afford given their level of income. Okay? So it will depict what combination choices that are actually available for the consumer to choose based upon their income. Therefore, as long as the consumer chooses a combination choice along their budget line, the expenditure will always sum up to their income. So let's look at how we can actually construct this budget line. Now it's important for us to realize that when we look at an indifference curve, we're looking at the quantities of two possible goods that the consumer can choose between. And this therefore means that we need to express our budget line not in dollars and cents, but actually in terms of the units of a good. Now, how, how can we possibly do that? In our example here, we have ice cream and quantity of hot dogs. And we have a consumer, we call him consumer A, who has an income of $50. Now, we have information about the price of the ice cream and the price of the hot dog. The ice cream for cone is $2, and the hot dogs is yeah, the hot dogs are five dollars for one. What it means, therefore, is two simple questions that we need to ask ourselves to be able to draw this budget line. The first question we can ask is, how much ice cream I can get if I were to invest all of my income, in this case fifty dollars, in ice cream? Well, the price of ice cream is two dollars, an income of fifty will yield, therefore. $2 into $50 is $25. So we are actually able to get 25 ice cream cones. Well, 25 ice creams, 25 units of ice cream, if we were to invest all of our income in this particular commodity. And in case in the, in the case of the hot dogs, the price of the hot dog is $5. Again, with an income of $50, would mean that I can get in total if I were to invest all of my income in hot dogs, 10 units. Now having these two plotted points will therefore allow us to draw a line to connect them. And it is this line that we call our budget line. So what we immediately see is that these two extreme points show that the expenditure will add up to 50. Because when we spend $50, the entire $50 on ice cream, it yields 25 units of ice cream and zero units of hot dogs. Okay? And when we spend all of our income on hot dogs, we get 10 units of hot dogs, but zero units of ice cream. And therefore, there are possible combination choices between those two extreme points. So we have three stars in our diagrams, and we're going to actually calculate the expenditure. Let's look at the first star here. At this star, we realize that 20 units of ice cream are chosen, and approximately we realize that we have two units of hot dogs. Now, 20 units of ice cream at a cost of $2 will be an expenditure of 40 and two units of hot dogs at a cost of five will be an expenditure of ten. We therefore realize that we have 
40 plus 10 is equal to 50. So we realize that this star that is along the budget line will yield an expenditure of 50, which therefore is equal to the income of the consumer A. Let's look at this lower star. Five units of ice cream and eight units of hot dogs. This will yield a cost of $10 for the ice cream and $40 for the hot dogs, which will be a total cost to the consumer of 50. So again, when we move down along the budget line, we increased our consumption of hot dogs and we reduced our consumption of ice cream. But as long as we stayed upon the budget line, we realized that our expenditure, our total expenditure of $50 was equal to the total income dedicated for consumption by this consumer A. Let's look at this third star. This star represents a combination choice of 15 units of ice cream and 10 units of hot dogs. Ultimately, the total expenditure in this case is $80. $80 is beyond the income of consumer A, and therefore we realize that this star is not attainable. It is a combination choice that is not attainable for the consumer. Now, what we can try to figure out is what will happen to the budget line when income changes. So in this particular example, we will look at what happens to the budget line when income moves from $50 to $70? Again, $50 to $70. We keep the price of ice cream at $2 per cone and hot dogs at $5 per one. So we have our initial budget line, 25 units of ice cream if all income was invested in ice cream and 10 units of hot dogs if all income was invested in hot dogs. And we have our budget line. Now to construct the new budget line with an income of 70 we have to go through the same process what will be the total number of ice cream when we invest it in, in the entire 70 dollars that will give us a value of 35 units and when we invest our entire income in hot dogs we get a total value of 15 units and therefore we realize that we have a new budget line that is actually now to the right of the initial or old budget line. We can therefore conclude that when there are increases in the income of a consumer, it will result in a shift, and not just any shift, but a parallel shift in the budget line. And in this case, because income increased, it means more units of either product can be achieved. And thus, it means that the shift will be to the right. So an increase in income brings about an outward or a rightward shift that is parallel in our budget line. So let's ask ourselves the inverse question. What if income was 70 and it moved to 50? Well, a decrease in income would simply mean that we will move from this red budget line to our purple budget line and therefore a decrease in income will be met by a leftward or an inward shift in our budget line. Okay? Let's examine what happens to the budget line when price of a product changes. So we are keeping income at 50, but in this case, we're keeping the price of ice cream at $2 per cone. But what we're looking at now is what happens when hot dogs decrease from 5 to $2. So again, we have our initial budget line. Now, at a cost of $5, you can only get 10 hot dogs. But if price fell from 5 to 2, it will mean you have 2 into 50 is 25. And therefore, the new point of, or the new quantity of hot dogs will be 25 units. So in this case here, we can now afford more hot dogs. And therefore, because the price of ice cream remain the same, it will be the same 25 units of ice cream but we now have 25 units of hot dogs that we can afford. Therefore, we will have an outward or rightward pivotal swing. And it will pivot with the axis or the fulcrum being on 25 units of ice cream because there was no increase or change in the units of ice cream. So there's an outward or rightward pivotal swing 
in the budget line. This happened because it was only the price of hot dogs that changed and the change was a decrease, meaning more units of hot dogs could be achieved. Okay? Now, if we ask the inverse again, if price was initially 2 and it now rose to 5, we would see a movement of having being able to afford 25 units, but with an increase from 2 to $5 in price, it will reduce the amount we can actually consume in the hot dogs from 25 units to 10. And therefore, a four, an, an increase in price of a product will be met by an inward pivotal swing in our budget line. And therefore, we could conclude that when there's a change in income of a consumer, there will be a parallel shift, whether it will be to the left or to the right. It all depends on whether income increases or decreases. And when there is a change in the price of a product, it will result in a pivotal swing. And whether it will be inward or an outward pivotal swing will depend on whether the, product of the, the price of the product increased or decreased. Now, let's pull all of this together. So we have, we, we, we discussed before the indifference curves and we discussed the budget line. Now, how can we therefore maximize utility under the ordinal utility approach? Well, if a, every consumer has an indifference map and they will of course desire to be on the highest indifference curve, but they are ultimately limited by the budget line. We can therefore intuitively determine that the utility that will maximize the consumption, or sorry, the quantity of units that will maximize the utility of the consumer will be where your budget line is actually tangential to your indifference curve. Remember, the consumer, if you look at this diagram here, the consumer would prefer to be on in this indifference curve. Let me just make a small correction here. Okay, so the consumer would prefer to be on I3, which yields a value of utility of 50. They wouldn't want to be on 30, nor would they want to be on 20. But in life, it's not about what you want, but what you can afford. And given that the budget line depicts the income of the individual, and it can only touch I2, which yields a value of 30, that, at the point of tangency, the relevant amount of good Y, in this case represented by bracket 1 in, numeral, in Roman numerals, and the relevant amount of good X represented by the second bracket, okay, that those are the quantity of units of both good Y and good X that will be consumed by the individual that would allow them to achieve utility, and that is maximize their utility. So this is the process of utility maximization under the ordinary utility theory. I do hope that this session was informative and stay tuned for more videos. Thank you.